check, check, check. My name is Ben Gray. I'm so thrilled to be able to welcome y'all to uh, LHPM tonight. Uh, I'm going to do a few announcements, then we're going to play a game, and then we're going to sing and worship together. All right. So, we on, uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays, we have a prayer room. Um, again, you know the spiel. It's awesome. We get to, as, uh, as brothers and sisters, come before the Lord um, and be reverent and pray together, and it's awesome. I thoroughly enjoy it. Highly recommend uh, y'all come to that if you can. On Mondays from 4 to 5, uh, and then uh, on uh, Wednesdays from 5 to 6. Um, we do not have a prayer room or LHPM next week, though. Uh, so the week after that, come, please. Um, so then uh, we also, uh, just, a, just a quick quick little thing. Um, outside, you know, there was that photo booth uh, for Emma. There's a book over there by that, uh, by that photo booth. Uh, if you take a picture, you can leave that little picture in there along with a note to her. Um, as this is her last LHPM. With us, so we're uh, we're honoring her in that way. Um, so if you if you want to leave or write her a note, uh, that book is out there for that. All right, so now we're gonna head on to the game. I don't believe there's any more announcements, um, and we're gonna have again. Alexa's gonna explain it to us again. Where's Where Alexa? There she is. <laughs> All right, her, her voice was a little muffled, but I think you got the idea. You stack the cup, and you stack the paper on top, stack the cup on top, and yank it. You see how I missed? If you missed like that, you got to start back over with the bottom one, place it on top like that. Uh, again, you have 60 seconds to do so. Uh, I have extra cards here and extra cups just in case they fall off. But you have to do four cups and four cards. And then, uh, and then actually, I believe it's three cards and four cups and yank it like that. All righty. So, Aaron, I said you could go first. Come on up here. Let's give it up for Aaron. Let's go. All right. So, there you are. And once... Once you hear the air horn go off, you can stack your first cup and then the paper on top of it. And you have to have all four cups stacked up there before you can start pulling cards, all right? All right, everybody, uh, you can go ahead and start. The game begins in three, two, one, go. Let's go, Aaron! All right, now you can start pulling the cards off. Oh. You can do this. You have a 
25 seconds left. The trick is to pull the index cards as fast as you can. Move it out of the way of the cup. Oh, you got 15 seconds. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You can do it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, let's give it up for Aaron. Good job, bro. Good job. All right, who else? What? You go. In the front. All righty. Let's start it upside. Okay, you go. Nice try, nice try. All righty. So I did this earlier, and the most success that I had was when I made sure they were lined up from this way, this way, and then pull as fast as you can on that card. Uh, so let's see if you can do it, Micah. Start us off, side. that way.
All right, y'all. Uh, welcome to LHBM. Good to see all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Colton. I'm the youth pastor. It's good to, to see you guys here tonight. Um, we're finishing up our series uh, on practice the way of Jesus, and tonight is about the practice of party. Um, Jesus is a partier. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the, the point for us is we have a culture of celebration because of that idea. Because Jesus partied, we want the culture and the feel of every room that we enter into to be one where a celebration or a party could break out at any time, which is why I've always said, like, hey, if, if you ever see something that you just want to throw your hands together and start clapping for, uh, unless it's something just ridiculously sarcastic and mean, um, if it's something like that, like, we'll always, that's always welcome. I think anybody that's ever celebrated this is something where they experience the goodness of God. And so uh, we're going to talk about that today. That's why you got the, all the different things that you have and stuff like that. And we have a few more surprises still waiting uh, in just a minute, but i um, very excited for tonight. Let's pray. Um, and, and if you're like, man, I, don't, I just don't know that God is a, a partier. I promise you that he is. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, and so just, just ask, um, even as we pray, just so like maybe you could see God differently tonight, because I think primarily our experience isn't one where he loves to celebrate. Rather, he loves to condemn is, is normally what we think. Um, but that's not who he is. So... Um, Yeah, I want us to celebrate him for the love that he has for us and all of that. So let's pray, and then we'll sing, and then we'll we'll hear from his word. But y'all pray with me. If you want to get down on your knees, by all means, you're welcome to. Father, you say that in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The psalmists seem to get it right. Where they're able to consider you and say, who have I in heaven but you? And what does earth have beside you that I desire? Lord, a God who loves with a celebratory love, the God who loves with a love that's sacrificial. God, that's who you are. So, Father, I just pray for tonight as we finish up LHPM for this semester and kind of put a stamp on the end of it and wait for the summer. Um, God, I just pray that this would be just a time where uh, things that are still questioning our, in our minds and doubts that we have about you and your love for us, your care for us, or things that we're still wondering about, about following you. God, I pray that we settle those things tonight. Uh, Lord, for those that aren't following you, that they commit to. Those that have trouble believing in you, that they would believe that those that have a hunger for you would ultimately be filled. And so, Father, I just pray for that, that you would help us in those ways. Lord, would you bless our worship, allow it to be actual worship, where we actually worship you, where we sing these words to worship you, to lift you up with our mouths and with our voices. Father, I pray that you receive it as honor, and that you meet us here, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Day of victory. <laughs> no, no, no. You're good. You're good, Trey. You're just going to count us off. Oh, my God. Give it up for Trey, everybody. <laughs> we kind of had a crazy practice, so. Whew. Yeah, you're going to just count us off. Redeemed and restored 
been thinking as I've been thinking about just how this whole series and how we're wrapping up the this time of, of Colton teaching on the practice in the way of Jesus um, the following verse came to mind from 2nd Corinthians oh it's okay if you don't have it I got it um, yeah 2nd Corinthians 3 verse 17 through 18 says now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I just kept coming back to that, um, the part that says, and we with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord. Like that is my, my prayer, is just as we spend time in his presence, as we spend time seeking God, seeking his face, and just being with our King, that we would feel just a freedom and that we would um, just see him and behold him with an unveiled face. I think sometimes um, we can come in with our own just like junk and, and shame or whatever it is that we carry. We car come carrying these heavy burdens and I just love this image of like us beholding him and then him giving us just through his spirit like that is that is where we get the grace to to walk out these things that we're learning every week, to walk out these things that we're practicing as we practice the way of God, like the way of Jesus. Um, when I hear that word practice, it just, in my mind, it, it just makes me think of like, you know, do better, do better, work harder kind of thing. And like, but I was just reminded today of just the sweetness that like, it is by his spirit that we can just walk these things out and that just, um, as we spend time with him tonight in singing and in listening to the teaching, I just pray that um, my heart would be that you would just sense his presence and, and also see that, like, it's his spirit that allows us to do those things to begin with. So um, he's just a really good father. Um, I'm so thankful he does it just, you know, make me like, hey, try again. Keep trying, keep trying. Like he pours out his love. He pours out his grace and his mercy. So this last song is just, 
all about the goodness of God and just um, just so thankful that he gives us everything that we need to walk this life and to pursue him like he gives it to us.
of the goodness of God. Thank you, God, for just tonight and just this chance to, um, I know I've been reflecting on the whole last semester and the whole year, and just, I'm just so thankful um, for all the things you've done in our ministry and all the things you've done in our students. Um, You've been so kind to us. You've been so good. You're such a good father. Um, Lord, we love you, and we just thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. You want to celebrate our worship team real fast? Um, hey, look, I know that you guys have the, uh, the, the lights and the whole thing. I am completely ADD, okay? So uh, just do me a favor, just, just for the teaching. You're, you guys are going to be able to go ham here in a second. Um, but just during the teaching, try not to use those things as a weapon for Satan, Okay? which is a way that you could be a distraction against what the Lord actually wants to do here. Uh, and I use those words, a weapon for Satan. Um, it sounds kind of funny, but like Paul talks about people like that. So don't do that. Don't be a weapon for Satan. Uh, that's no fun. Um, so yeah, just, it, just in this space, just, I know that you have them and all the rest of it, and shiny objects are like, ooh, squirrel. Don't do that. All right. Um, practicing the way of Jesus, we're talking about that. Hannah was talking about that idea of like the Spirit empowers us to do that. I'm so glad that she, she talks about that. Yes, this is not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be a blessing for us to practice the way of Jesus. It does require effort. There is effort in Christianity. Uh, there's not earning in Christianity, but there is effort. Um, and so sometimes I feel like people are like, man, if the Lord wants me to do something, the Spirit will just empower me to do that, and I'll just wait until he does. You don't do that with food and feeling full. You didn't like, if the Lord wanted me to be full, the Spirit would fill me with food. No. No, nope, you eat food, and you do that with water, too. So we have a natural practice of, of pursuing things and doing things in order to experience the fullness that's here and now. And so in the same way, to practice the way of Jesus does require effort. Don't earn anything by it, but following Jesus does require effort. He talks about putting your hand to the plow. Anyone who puts her hand to the plow and turns back isn't worthy of me, is what he says. And so there is this idea of, like, man, it, he, there's something inside the practice of following him that he's saying, like, there's blessing here. And to those who actually put it into practice, put my word into practice, they experience that thing. And so just so we know that as we're, as we're talking about some of these things. But this is uh, John 2, um, verses 1 through 11. It's a story about Jesus at a wedding. This is what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now, Draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn it knew. Then he called to the bridegroom aside, and he said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you've saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. I share this on Sunday just a, a little bit, uh, but I want to talk about practices again. A couple of weeks ago, I was with my wife, and we had, to, we had to walk through this marriage counseling practice thing where I had to write 25 things about her that I love. And I love my wife. There's, I mean, there's a, a, a season in, in time where it's like, I just, I love you, we're committed to you, you've been together 10 years married and almost 11 now. Um, but in doing the practice, and like in actually doing the thing, like I love her already, but I'm, I'm, the practice was write down 25 things that you appreciate about her, that stir your affection for her, that make you love her. And so I just wrote down 25. They came pretty easily. I was sitting by myself, wrote down 25. And it was in this process of like actually doing the practice that I just, in the midst of it, like it did something in my heart and in my soul to remind me of like, oh yeah, she's awesome. And like, 
It's not like writing, it wasn't making stuff up like as if I was like writing it and then when I wrote it, it came true in her life. Like this is stuff that just existed in her life. And so I, you can think like you already knew that about her. Certainly if you already know that about her, it should stir, some, you should, it should stir something in your heart. But that wasn't the case. It was when I actually walked through the practice that I experienced the richness. When I put in the effort of the practice is where I, I experienced the richness of what the practice was there for in order to help me to once again have my affections stirred for her in a really wonderful way. And so in the same way, when Jesus says practice the way of Jesus, it does require effort. But there is this idea that he's like, look, it's just, it's just something that it, there's, there's just riches and glory available to those who are willing to believe me that there's something there. Someone like, yes, the, the riches and glory are there. But there's something, if you'll just do the practice, you'll experience something that you wouldn't have experienced otherwise. If you choose not to do it, you're not going to experience it. But if you choose to press in and do the practice, you'll experience those things. That was my experience with doing that, that marriage counseling practice. And that is true of what Jesus is calling us to hear, especially with this one. When he says that we should practice uh, putting his word into practice, we should practice being like him, that is especially true. We, ex- we especially experience the riches of knowing Jesus when we practice this idea of party, when we practice party, when we practice celebration, you experience not just there is riches and glory available. When you do that, when you are at a party and you're experiencing it in Jesus' name, you experience really, really wonderful stuff that you just, if you just didn't go, you wouldn't experience those things. And so I want us to talk about the practice of party and help us to understand why we need to do this. In my opinion, the church parties too little. We should party more. We should have more parties for random things and just throw down every week. It should be, Wednesday night should feel like that most of the time. There's a time to be solemn, but there's a time to rejoice, and I think the church parties too little. So we need to practice the, the, the practice of partying. Okay, the first reason why is because we remind ourselves when we, when we practice partying, we remind ourselves that Jesus is better than we think he is. When we party, we remind ourselves that, oh yeah, Jesus is better than we think he is. We don't need to miss the fact that this is Jesus' first sign and miracle. Like his first sign and miracle, he, he, the, the first one, like to inaugurate, to be like, what's he going to do to show that he is awesome in God? Like he doesn't heal the sick. He doesn't heal somebody who's, who's you know, paralyzed or anything like that. He doesn't cast out a demon and be like, I got power over darkness, son. Like that's not what he does. Like instead, what he does, he uses his first power to make sure the party could go another day. Like, there's something about that, like, we need to recognize that, like, the first time he, 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 like, flexed his arm, I was like, what can you do? Oh, I can make sure there's wine here so that this party doesn't end two days too soon, but I can actually make it go a little longer. We need to really, really understand that, like, he is giving a sign here for what he's about. And he's like, this is going to be the first place uh, where he ultimately flexes his power. And so... This is important because, again, we said, I said this earlier, but I think our primary experience with God is that we don't view him this way. We see God as a, um, a joy killer, like someone who is actually robbing us of joy, something like that. Uh, we see him as someone we, who primarily, like, if he showed up to a party, I think the way we experience Jesus, like, if he showed up to a party, he'd probably take away all the alcohol, call your parents, and make you leave. Like, I think that's primarily how we think of him. And, and yet, like, what's presented here is, is that's not the case. We don't, but, but we don't see him that way. He's someone who shows up to the party and he's like, oh, you guys are running out. Oh, I'll take care of that. Don't worry about that. And he takes care of that. Like, and this isn't, this isn't primarily how we see him. He, he isn't someone who, who runs in and is like, you guys are having too much fun. Turn that music down. Get out. Like, he doesn't do that. He actually runs into this party. They're asking him for something. And he ultimately uses his power to allow the celebration to continue. He is filled with joy. He is filled with celebration. 150 gallons of wine is what he offered to this situation. 150 gallons of wine is what he brought in. He's not here to take away the abundance. He's here to ultimately give more than what we can possibly imagine. He's better than we think he is. Again, I think we primarily view Jesus as boring or a joy killer, and he's just not that way. That's not who he is. The religious people in his day, the the Pharisees and the all those other people, the Sadducees and teachers of the law and the scribes, like all those people thought he was the way that most of us think that he is. They, they thought that God would be like, if God shows up, he would be kind of boring, very solemn, and angry at everybody all the time. That's what they were expecting 
when God showed up, when, they, when like the Messiah came. They were expecting him to be very reserved, respectable. They did not expect somebody tossing in 150 gallons of wine. They didn't expect that. And so it makes sense that like when Jesus shows up and he's eating and drinking and he's going to parties, it's like, this can't be God. He's having too much fun. Like literally, that's, that's why they, they reject him because he's going to too many parties. Like he can't be the God that we've been longing for. He can't be the God that we've been waiting for. He's not boring enough. He's not angry at all. He seems to really enjoy having a really good time. He seems to be having too much fun. This can't be him. This is why they reject him. Like, it's ironic. Many, like, in, this is me growing up, and many of the students and people I talk to, the, the reason people reject God is because they think he's boring and a joy killer and all those different things. The reason they rejected God is because the reason they rejected Jesus is because he was not boring, too much of a partier, and had too much fun. Do you see how it's the opposite? The religious people in his day were looking for God and looking for a boring one, and we're going, I don't want a God who's boring. Like, we literally have just crossed paths somewhere. We reject him because we think he's boring. They rejected him because he was having too much fun. Do you see how this is switched for us? Like, this isn't, this isn't actually who he is. He didn't align with their way of thinking. They rejected God. They rejected Jesus as God, again, because he was having too much fun. And so, for us, as we consider who Jesus actually is, I think it's important to understand that, like, he came to throw a party. He came to invite people into that party. That's what he is about, and that's what you see here. He's filled with joy. Dallas Willard says this. He says, if we're ever going to properly know God, we must first understand that he's the happiest being in the universe. If we're ever going to actually know him properly, not just like, like a wrong view of him, but if we're going to know him properly, we must first understand that he's the happiest being in the universe. And when we party, when we celebrate, we remind ourselves that partying was his idea. Partying was something that he showed up for too. Partying was something that he was joy-filled about. He's more joy-filled, he's more fun than we think. And so when we do that, we're reminded of those things. Second reason, second reason, we party, when we do that, we remind ourselves of what Jesus came to do. We remind ourselves of what Jesus came to do. In this story, Jesus transforms water into wine. He transforms basically something that's, that's worthless and, and empty. Emptiness, he, he transforms emptiness into abundance. And this is important for us to understand because if you, the water has a lot of significance there. So if you think of Genesis 1, and it says the earth was formless and empty and the waters covered the face of the deep. Waters and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then what did God do? He looks at the emptiness of the world that's covered by water and the formlessness of it, and he adds abundance to it. And he separates these things, and he adds things in there, and he does all this stuff. And he takes something that's empty and formless, and he forms it, but he transforms it into a space of abundance. And so what you see Jesus here is he's just doing the exact same thing. He has this water that's empty in terms of use, and the party's about to die, and he's like, I can transform emptiness into abundance. That's what he came to do. That's what he wants to do. And so where there was water, Jesus once again turns it into abundance. And if you notice what the man says in the passage, he says, the master of the banquet, he tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and then he called the bridegroom aside and said, you saved the best till now. Like, you, you, you didn't give the, the best earlier. Like, you've saved the best till now. And, they, and he didn't know, and the, the servants did, but he didn't know, and most of the people didn't know. Like, he didn't know that Jesus, this is Jesus' wine. This is what Jesus had done. He didn't know that. But what everybody at that party understood, even though they didn't know that, everybody at that party understood that this is better than what we've had on our own. Like everything that we've had just us, this is far better than anything we've experienced just us. They, all of them would have, would have agreed. If they had known that Jesus is, that had, had done this, they would all say, oh, Jesus' abundance is, is a lot better than ours. This tastes so much better than what we were able to accomplish on our own. And this is what he came to do. He came to look at our lives and go, you think you've experienced joy in your life? You think you've experienced some abundance because you got a girlfriend finally? Like, that just ain't it. Like, there's more to it. And he's going, if you think that you've experienced some, some real abundance or real joy in your time, and you're like, I've experienced that. He's like, you, you have no idea what's available to you. Like, nothing that you could do on your own. Like, well, well done. You did something that made your heart feel glad. Good for you. But, like, you have no idea. How much more is available to you? I can take everything that's empty and bring joy and abundance and fullness into it. And so that's what he, when we party, when we ultimately, when we celebrate and we see those things, we're reminded like this is actually what he came to do. And so if you're ever at a celebration or you ever are being celebrated where people are celebrating you and it's like, 
you feel like life has been given to you and like you finally can breathe and like I'm loved and I'm noticed and all this. Like when you experience that, you realize for the first time maybe, it's like, hey, this is actually what you experience right here in the midst of this celebration that feels so good. All of this joy that you're filled with, everything of like this celebration, it's like this was so much fun. All of that, what you're reminded of is that that is exactly what Jesus came to do. And so he walks into this part and he looks at something that's empty and he ultimately transforms it into abundance. And he's like, when you experience that at a celebration, you are literally experiencing what I came to bring into your life, into your heart in a full way. I want to do that completely. I don't want to just do it in one area, on one night, on a Saturday night. I don't want to just do it. Anytime you experience any kind of joy like that, he's like, that's a reminder of what I actually came to do. I didn't come to still steal and kill and destroy your world. I actually came to take the emptiness that you're searching to fill, and I came to fill it. I came to be the one to do that. He saved the best till now. And so what he's saying to us is like, I can transform that too. I can transform your emptiness into abundance as well. So Jesus is better than what we think, and he can take those things that ultimately we've been trying to fill, and he can actually fill those things. And we're reminded every time we do that. We're reminded that that's what he's about. Okay, last thing. When we party, I, I believe we experience the heart of God. When we celebrate, I believe that we experience the heart of God. Again, the joy and all the rest of it, I think we experience those things. I wrote this down, and I'm going to read it just because um, I want us to understand this, and I want to kind of tell a narrative story from, like, the beginning of the Bible to, like, where we're at right now. But I wrote it down just so, so I'm going to read it to you because I want I to read it slowly and I want it to make sense. But... I do believe as we experience celebration, as we actually party together in the name of Jesus, I believe that we experience what God's heart has always been. Not this, like God changed when it turned into Jesus, and now it's just, it's not, not that, that's some heresy anyways, but like, not that. But like, this is actually what he's been about the entire time, and I want to show you that. So, just bear with me as I read this, and you can read along too. Okay, we must see God as the great party planner. We must see God as the great party planner. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see him setting up the greatest party of all time. He gets everything ready, the environment, the food, the drinks. He even gets the people there, two of them, Adam and Eve, and tells them to make more people so that they can experience the joy of this celebration. But just as the celebration begins, just as the beat was about to drop, sin comes in like the noise police and shuts down the party and forces everyone to leave. This great party planner spends the rest of the Bible working on ways to finally get the party back up and going so that the people can rejoin the celebration. He sets up new party rules in a new venue called the temple. He, he knows more rules aren't the best way to liven up a party, but they're necessary to keep the peace, and he'll take what he can get. Yet, even with all of that, it doesn't work. At every turn, sin keeps getting in their way. It's inevitable. Every time the great party planner gets close to pumping up the volume, setting out the snacks, busting open the doors again and inviting everyone in, sin kills the party. So when Jesus shows up and parties so hard that people have a hard time believing that he's God, we see why. The great party planner has been waiting to bust a move for generations. And when he finally crushes sin on the cross, the great party planner doesn't just open the door, he tears that sucker down from top to bottom completely down so that it will never be closed again. Sin is finally defeated. The party is back on and bumping, and all are invited to attend. From beginning to end, he's been trying to get everybody in the same room. Like, just get in here. There's glory here. There's just joy here. In my presence is fullness of joy. Like, I just want you here. And sin has always been the noise police going like, oh, guys, we really don't. you got to get out of here. And you got to go, and you can't enjoy it. And finally, Jesus crushes sin on the cross, and he tears the curtain from top to bottom and is like, never again will I shut that door. Never again will they be cast out. Everybody's invited in, and everybody can enjoy the party. If we don't see him like that, and just read the Bible, like just all the way through, you get to the end of the Bible in Revelation, and what is there at the very end of the Bible? It's a gigantic wedding celebration. Jesus is back at a wedding, and there's new wine flowing, and he's provided it all because he was the one who sacrificed his life on the cross. And so you see this consistently. From beginning, there's a celebration. To the end, there's a celebration. In the midst of it, there's a celebration. Like God is constantly just going, like, I don't know where the line was drawn, and you guys forgot who I was, but this is always who I've been. I'm a God who parties. I'm a God who wants to invite people into these things. And we primarily look at our lives, and we look at the fun that we can have and go, like, I can't invite God into my life because then I won't have fun. And it's like, do you not realize that fun began with him? And what you're doing is actually probably something that's not fun. It might feel fun, but it's destructive. Like, it's actually killing you. 
and give it enough time and it will wedge in there and it will actually crush you. And he's like, I'm just inviting people in to this thing that I've been trying to allow them to experience the whole time. If we don't see him this way, we'll miss the heart of God and we'll miss him altogether. We'll reject him. And I think some of you maybe do this. Like you reject God for a certain reason and you reject him because you think he's not fun or you feel like you can't have fun with him. And the issue with is he's like, you're rejecting something, you're just not rejecting me. Like you, there are reasons to reject Jesus, but he's like, this just isn't one of them. Watch me at a party. Everybody wanted to be around this. Everybody wanted to see the party go on a little longer and I was the one that allowed the party to go on a little longer because there's abundance in me that I long to give out. Eliezer Gonzalez says, the kingdom of heaven this thing that Jesus came to bring us. The kingdom of heaven is a party with an open invitation. This is available to all of us. Anybody who can believe, who, who will actually believe and go like, okay, I have only ever heard that God or thought that God is this way. But according to the scripture, he seems to be completely different than that. Anybody that can make that switch and go like, maybe he's not everything that I thought he was. Maybe he's actually better than I think that he is. The people who can believe that actually experience who God really is. And then they get to enjoy this abundance that he came to give. And he says this again. He's like, I came to give life and life in abundance. So that's who he is. When we party, I believe those are the things that we experience. I believe we realize, it's like, oh, man, maybe he's better than he thinks. Maybe, maybe he's better than I think that he is. I'm reminded of that. If it's true that like maybe this is what he came to do. When I experience the joy of this, this is what he came to do. Maybe this is the actual heart of God. So how do we practice partying? Some of you, maybe you know how to throw a party. But here's how we can practice it. Uh, the first is uh, make a fun list. Make a fun list. This sounds fun. The, th- the same way that like I made a list like for about my wife of like the things I love about her. Make a fun list. Write down a list of fun things that you love to do. And then just choose one per week, and do that thing, but invite people into it. Like the way that the Lord is constantly inviting people into things, invite people into it. Make a fun list. Um, <laughs> it's cool. Take photos if you'd like. Uh, make a fun list, and then invite people into it. Just write it down. Make, if you made 52 fun things that you like to do, you have one per week, and then invite somebody into it and go do that thing. Man, that'd be fun. Invite me. I'd love to go if I'm available. Make a fun list. If you don't invite me, it's okay. Just don't tell me that you didn't invite me because I hate not being invited. Okay. Second. Second thing is throw mini celebrations. I've said this before, but my son, anytime he does something good, anytime he does something good, he's like, this is his response real fast. I'm like, good job, man. He's like, yeah. Just a mini, just a mini celebration. Just a, just a quick clap to be like, crushed it. Like he just, just this tiny little thing. But for him, it's this trigger of like, I did something good. Let's go. And, like, just have some, my wife does, like, this thing where she goes to, uh, if she goes to, like, the supermarket or, or something, and then all of a sudden she finds a parking spot, like, near the front. She, she and the Lord have an inside joke about that, that, like, Lord, if you'll give me a, a, a spot at the front, like, I'll know that, like, you, you see me and you're caring for me. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't mean that he doesn't see her. But when it happens, she's like, she's like, you see me, you see me, I got the par- parking spot. Even if there's an old lady that's trying to get in, she's like, nope, the Lord saw me first, okay. <laughs> Not that. But just these mini celebrate, like when something happens, just have a response. We do this naturally. Your team wins or you, something good happens and you're high-fiving. I mean, there's just something that we naturally do. There's a celebration. Throw a mini celebration. Do these often. Do it to where people think you're weird for ce- Like, why'd you celebrate that? It's like, oh, because I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm supposed to mini celebrate my life. Like, do that thing, whatever it is. I said this on Sunday, but I really do want to be the loudest table in any restaurant. I want people to come up to me and say, like, hey, I'm sorry, sir. Could you keep it down? And like, oh, yeah, so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Like, what are you guys celebrating? Like, is it a birthday that you're celebrating? Like, why are y'all being so loud? It's like, no, no, no. All of our sins are forgiven. And so we need more food, more desserts, more chocolate pie. Please. Okay. That's what did it. That's what got you there, chocolate pie. All right. Throw many celebrations. Third, find a reason to celebrate at any gathering. Find a reason. If you're, if you're gathered together and you can all of a sudden, something good happens and you throw your hands together and you just start clapping. Thank you. Find, 
Find a reason to celebrate at any gathering. We, again, we did this with a birthday activity. We find these random reasons like, what can we celebrate? What can we be overjoyed about? And the reason is, is when we experience it, we genuinely believe. Like when we genuinely experience some of that joy, we actually believe that like, oh, I'm going to experience some of the goodness of God in my time. I'm going to experience what he came to get. He wants me to experience joy. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. I know. I know. It's a rich time. The teaching is so gold. All right. (laughs) He wants you to experience that joy. And so we look for these phases where we can celebrate. We're going to celebrate Emma going, I mean, not celebrate her going away, but her time here in a couple of minutes. We're going to go to Sean's, and we're going to do that. We have our own food and our own dessert and our own stuff. It's like we're finding the reason to celebrate at every given moment because when we experience that joy, we're experiencing the heart of the Father. So find reasons to celebrate. If there's somebody in your life, and they're sitting there, and they're kind of down, Throw them a random party. Like, you're, you're down on Thursday. You're, you're sad, and this is your not sad party. And throw them a party. Invite them over and have everything for them. And then fourth, redemptive calendar. God primarily, from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, God primarily, when, whenever he worked among the people, he primarily would tell them, like, hey, I want you to remember what I did for you. And they're like, okay, how do I, how do I remember what, what we did, what you did for me? How do I remember that? He's like, I want you to have a celebration. I want you to hold a festival, or I want you to throw a party. Like, here's how I want you to remember. I want you to do those things. And so you see this all throughout the Old Testament. You see them throwing parties and celebrations, these long things where they're like, don't do any work. Like, don't go to school. Don't send your kids. To like, don't do anything. Like, just celebrate what I did. Remember it through a party. And so in the same way, you need to, when God breaks into your life and does something and changes something or transforms something or heals somebody or does something, Mark it on your calendar and be like, this is a day that I'm going to remember, and I'm going to remember it with a celebration. I'm going to remember it with a party. And every time that, that day rolls around, all of a sudden it happens, and you're throwing a party. You're throwing a, or just throwing stuff to the ground in the back. You're just so excited that you're throwing things down. Like, maybe that's what you're doing. You're just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just throwing a party because I'm so excited because God did this thing. Everybody would be like, is it somebody's birthday? Why are you having this party? It's not flag day. It's not Christmas. Like, what, what's happening? What are you doing? It's like, oh, this is the day that God healed so-and-so. And so I just want to remember it. I want to remember it with the celebration. And so my encouragement to you guys is to put those back on the screen. <laughs> what are y'all doing back there? A mini celebration. All right. Look, I've, I've, lost, I've lost track of this thing. So, um, no, I know where I'm at. Thank you. <laughs> but I appreciate that, Joshua. Um, it's hard. It, it, is, it is hard a little bit because I'm like, more than anything in my life, like, this is why I didn't follow Jesus until I was 17. Like, my primary experience with Christians, and if you would call yourself a Jesus follower, my primary experience with you guys was that you were boring, lifeless, guilt-ridden, unfun, completely like, it was just every, every Christian, stay with me. I mean, I'm not joking, I'm being serious. My primary experience with, with, with Christians in my school, with people who call themselves Jesus followers, was a life lived that made everybody else go like, man, you say you got good news. Like, you you would testify to the fact that the most important thing in your life is this Jesus character, and your life looks miserable, it sounds miserable, you don't seem to like it yourself. Why would anybody want what you have? Life's hard enough. Why would I ever want what you have? That's what was the primary experience. And so, when I finally read the Bible for myself and realized that Jesus was at a party and it was about to end, and he didn't let it end, but he used his power first to flex and go, no, 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 I want to use my first power in order to keep a celebration going. And the reason he did that is because he's like, this is my heart, this is who I am. I want people to experience the goodness of my father and the goodness of who I am, and I want them to relate to having joy at this party to having joy with me, that these things are the same. When I read that, and I was like, these, all those Christians at my school were doing it all wrong. Like, y'all are, y'all are, you're, you're, 
killing yourself over something like, you don't even know the God you claim to believe in. You don't even understand that he's a God who is a party animal, and because we're Jesus followers, we are as well, as Tony Campolo says. Like, this is who he is, and from beginning to end, to read the scriptures and go, he's constantly throwing celebrations over and over and over again. And I was constantly looking for joy in all these other different things, and only to find out that, like, it actually lives in him. So yes, for me, it is like, this is maybe the most, one of the most important things I could possibly teach because when Christians get this right, they present to the world a God who actually is joy-filled and loving and can give them what they've always been longing for but never able to find. And so as followers of Jesus, if you actually claim to be one and you're not just by name only, which many of them are, if you're actually a follower of Jesus and your experience isn't joy-filled and your experience, now I'm not saying that you won't walk through suffering, everybody does that. But if your primary experience isn't one where you're like, no, 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 he actually does lead people into abundance, my encouragement to you is to just, just consider, I think you're doing it wrong. I think he's better than what you think that he is. And so, yes, make a fun list. Do these things. When people ask you, why are you doing this? Why would you make 52 things that are fun? Because I'm a Jesus follower. And I'm supposed to, when I experience fun and joy, I experience the heart of God. Throw many celebrations. Find a reason to celebrate somebody in your life. And then have a redemptive calendar. Mark the areas where he's broken into your life. Do that. I want our ministry to be about that. This is why we mark these things at United when we do a celebration at the end of the trip. Just to mark, like, God, you were faithful. And so let's mark this out. Let's throw a party. And that's why we're going to do it today. We're going to throw a party. So let me pray. And then I'll talk to you. Father, um, I do love this about you. I love that you, um, from beginning to end, you were constantly celebrating at the beginning of the Bible. You're celebrating through the middle of it, and you're celebrating at the end. God, I pray that we would follow you in this way, that we experience your heart. Those of us in this room who struggle to believe that you actually are like this, God, I pray that you'd give them faith to see it. Just give them eyes to read your Bible so that they can see this is who you actually are. Father, would you help us to experience your heart even tonight as we celebrate as we eat and drink and enjoy, God, I pray that we would be reminded this is what you came to do. This is what you're about. And this is what you long for us to experience in your name. Amen. All right, uh, we're going to sing. Um, so you can turn all your lights back on. Uh, we're going to sing, and uh, then we'll, we'll talk to you guys in just a second uh, as soon as it's over. But again, my encouragement to you is to, to enjoy it and to celebrate. But let's sing together. Yeah, man. Is that With all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm so addicted, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone.
going to small groups. What we're doing is we have ice cream out there for everybody. So look, 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 look. Two things. Two. One, just go out there and enjoy. And, but look, when you feast out there, when you do that, know that this is what it's like to know Jesus. He is trying to remind you that this is who he is. Second, 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 second. If you haven't already taken a photo in the photo booth for Emma Stover and written in her book to say thank you so much for four years of service, Go and do that, and let's celebrate her right now, and then go out there. Ready, set, celebrate! (laughs) 